Hi, I'm Russ Adams, and I'm the pastor of Western Reserve, and before I set up the sermon this morning, I wanted to give you a couple prayer concerns. Uh, since we last met together on March the 8th, uh, we've lost three individuals, uh, Bill Scannell, Bernie Parker, and George Sankey. I'm going to ask that you keep their family in our prayers. Uh, Mark Hulse's good friend, Eric McCollum, uh, died to celebrate his life this week, and Diane Price's mother, Lois, died in Indiana just yesterday. So I'm going to ask that you keep these individuals in your prayers, as long as, as well as Bill Helsel, uh, who is dealing with the coronavirus at St. E's uh, and Belmont, uh, and also Matthew Powell, who's dealing with the coronavirus at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm also going to ask that we pray for everybody who has the virus, everybody who is working with people with the virus, and everybody who is terrified of the virus. Uh, Here's my question for you today, and it kind of wraps around this three-part sermon series. Uh, when was the last time uh, you saw God? Uh, there's no other way to explain it. It, it has to be God. Uh, sometimes we experience God in, in the routine of life, you know, just a random act of kindness. Uh, sometimes it is in the miraculous. Uh, science cannot explain it. And sometimes I believe a God sighting can be found when we have a new insight or, or reflection on something. Uh, we call those experiences God sightings, and God sightings are important because they remind us that God is alive and well in this world. Uh, this is actually the first of three sermons uh, that I've grouped, grouped together and called God sightings. Uh, they're all from the Gospel of John, uh, and each one gives us a timeless truth. And so where we are today is that 20th chapter of John, and it's the great story of when Thomas doubts. So here's my title for today, Why Did Thomas Doubt? Uh, let us hear God's sacred word. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, on this day, we make the same great confessions that we always make. First of all, we confess that we're not perfect people. And the idea of us being perfect is even comical to our ears. We recognize that we have flaws. Father, we'll also admit it that, that all the negativity of our world right now and all the cautions of our world, world has sort of worn us thin. Uh, we need a sense of hope and we need a sense of optimism. And finally, Father, we'll all admit it, and it's always true, 
uh, that our own death bothers us, from the youngest person, the oldest, to the healthiest, to the most sickly, our own death bothers us, and the truth is, we're so selfish. We like to believe that we're going to live for eternity. And so once again, I just ask that you just pour the gift of preaching through me, that through my simple words, we may experience your word, so we can apply those words to our daily lives. Once again, we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. It was Voltaire who said that doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. I think that that's true. Uh, your doubts do not make you unique in the world. As a matter of fact, your doubts mean that you're simply part of the crowd. At the very heart of our reading for this morning is that, is that issue of, of doubt. Uh, where we are is the 20th chapter of John, and when the reading first begins, ten of the disciples are present when Jesus suddenly appears. Who's missing? Well, first of all, Judas Iscariot is missing. He's already taken his own life after betraying Jesus. But also it says later that Thomas is missing. I don't know where he was, but the truth is he should have been there. If he would have been there, then he wouldn't have doubted, but his absence fuels this doubt. It's the 25th verse, the one that grabs our attention, and it simply says this, quoting Thomas, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. For generations now, for generations, people have judged Thomas Harshly. You can be honest, of all the disciples, we judge Thomas more harshly than the rest, except for Judas Iscariot. And really, it's, it's unfair. It's only really one sentence, one phrase that he uttered that we remember. The rest of his life was a great life. Think about it. Thomas was called by Jesus, and he traveled with Jesus for three years. And traveling with Jesus, he got to experience the power of being with Jesus' aura. Thomas also got to hear those lessons firsthand. And with his own eyes, he saw all the miracles of Jesus. We have no reason to believe that Thomas was not excited on Palm Sunday and equally devastated on, on Good Friday. And even tradition tells us that Thomas lived a great life. Tradition tells us that he went to India and he proclaimed the greatest life that ever lived to those individuals. And also we we're told that, that Thomas died a meaningful death, martyred, and he was pierced with a sword. The truth is that he had a great life, but it's only that one phrase that we always seem to remember, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand there in his side, I will not believe. Why is it? Think about it for a moment. Why is it that we only remember the negative? I think we remember the negative of Thomas because we're the most like Thomas at that moment. Because we've all had doubts in our faith. And we've all had questions. You're not the first person, and ours is not the first generation. Co. Rogers was really one of the great uh, American psychologists, and at the age of 22, he actually enrolled at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. He said one of the first exercises that the seminary staff had him do was to get into groups and discuss their doubts. Rogers said later, as he looked back at his group and exploring their doubts, he says, we doubted our way right out of religious works, never to return. Here's the point. The point is this, that every person, every generation has always had their doubts. So let me ask you, do you have a few questions for God? And here's my other question, have you ever had more than a few doubts? But, but here's a question that I wrap my thoughts around today, and the question is this one, why did Thomas doubt? Throughout the ages, people have come up with great lists of why Thomas doubted, and I've come up with my own list through the years 
Uh, I came up with a list from a man by the name of James W. Moore. And James W. Moore wrote a lot of books, small books, mainly it was his sermons published. But he was also the, the senior pastor at St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Houston. He says that he believes that there are really three basic reasons why Thomas doubted, and I think that they have some merit. So, why did Thomas doubt? Perhaps Thomas doubted because he had, had just dropped out. In other words, uh, Thomas doubted because he wasn't with the rest of the disciples when Jesus suddenly appeared. The scripture says it clearly, uh, Thomas missed out on seeing the resurrected Jesus and the others told him about seeing the resurrected Jesus, but hearing about Jesus and experiencing the resurrected Jesus are really two different things. Just to say it bluntly, he doubted because he was absent. I think that that's really worth considering. Um, when I was young, uh, my best friend was a kid by the name of Jimmy Thompson, and if you've been with me through the years, I've talked about Jimmy Thompson in the past. Uh, he lived five doors up from my parents, and, and we were the same age, and, and we were natural friends. Uh, Jimmy was always fun to be with, and I liked going to his house because we were always unsupervised, okay? He liked coming to my house because it was clean, okay? And whenever my parents said, you know, you can bring a friend along, I always brought Jimmy Thompson. And we were fast friends for years, but that all ended when we were sophomores in high school. When he was a sophomore in high school, his, his parents went through an ugly divorce. Jimmy didn't really handle it well. They sent him off to live with his sister, Muriel. And Muriel didn't handle it well. She had her own issues in life to deal with, and it was an uncomfortable spot to put her in. And we were sophomores in high school. Jimmy looked at me, and I think it may have been the last time I talked to him, and he said, Russ, I've decided to drop out of school. I said, you're going to drop out of school? He goes, yeah. He says, I think everything that I know in life that I need, I can teach myself. Okay? I thought, you got to be kidding me. Even if I was a sophomore in high school, I knew you, there were a few other things that you might want to learn. I haven't talked to Jimmy Thompson in years, but I have talked to people that have, have heard about him. They said the best job Jimmy ever had was bagging groceries at the corner grocery store. And they say, I hate to say it, he's had a hard life. And every May 30th, the old traditional Memorial Day, I pray for Jimmy Thompson because that was his birthday. Why did Thomas doubt? Maybe he doubted because he, he simply dropped out. How many people do you know have actually dropped out of church? Now, I can't blame 100% of the people. The church is certainly not a, a perfect place. Sometimes church can be downright ugly. You know, we fight amongst each other. You know, we, we scoff about one another when we're not present. A small group tries to, to run everything, and I hate to say it, sometimes even the preachers do some really ugly, dumb things. There's a lot of good reasons to drop out, but you can't drop out because the church is still the best place to experience God, and the church is still the best place to learn about God. If you drop out of church, then where are you learning about God's and God's ways and, and proper theology? If you think you can teach yourself about God, you'll be just as successful as Jimmy Thompson. And you'll struggle your entire life trying to understand God. Some people doubt, Thomas doubted perhaps, because he, he dropped out. Why did Thomas doubt? Moore says that, that Thomas doubted possibly because he gave in. He, he simply, he gave in and, and, and he had his, he, he let science become the final answer. And you really can't blame him. After all these years of preaching the gospel, I've never been able to explain the resurrection to anybody. And the truth is, and the reason is that I really can't explain a miracle. But I do know this, your belief in, in the resurrection of Jesus, a miracle 
it's, it's extremely, extremely important. And for those people that dismiss the resurrection and for those of us who believe as being uninformed or uneducated, they're simply wrong. Science is not always the final answer. Do you know anybody who's, who's given in and let science become the final answer? Thomas Jefferson, obviously one of the great names in American history, uh, wasn't just the third president of the United States, he was really the chief writer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also a deist, which meant that he believed in logic, and he actually had his Bible rewritten, and he got rid of all the miracles in the Bible. Now think about everything that he missed out on. When he reread his Bible, and without the miracles, that meant that the virgin birth was gone. That meant that all the healing stories of Jesus were suddenly gone, that the resurrection of Jesus was suddenly gone. I've seen copies of his Bible. And if you illuminate all the miracles in the Bible, the Bible's about the third of the size of our Bible. Some of you believe that, that Thomas dropped out because he simply gave in to science. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not saying that science is a bad thing. I think science is a good thing. I think it's one of those, one of those paths to, to truth and knowledge. I also don't believe that it's the only path of, of truth and knowledge. Some of the greatest things, the most influential things in our world cannot be explained by science. I challenge you to find a scientific formula for love. I challenge you to sign a scientific formula for honesty or courage. There is no scientific formula for faith, for goodness, or humility. And you cannot jam mercy into a test tube. Those things are unexplained by science, but they're the most influential things in our world today. Some people believe Thomas doubted because he gave in to science. Some people believe that, that Thomas doubted because, because Thomas gave in, okay? He, he didn't just give up, he gave in. In other words, Thomas had doubts because he let death be the final answer to the story. The, the scripture doesn't tell us where in the world Thomas was when Jesus appeared to the others. All we know that he was gone. I have my own theory of where he was. I think he does what a lot of people do when life offers us a challenging moment, and that is that he got away and he reflected. And if you use your sanctified imagination, you can almost see Thomas walking down every back street of, of Jerusalem. And he was wondering how everything that was so right just a few days earlier had gone so wrong. These great promises that they had with Jesus just a few days earlier were suddenly over. And he was devastated and didn't know what to do, so he just had to get away and get some fresh air and, and think. He shouldn't have went away. He should have stayed and experienced the resurrected Jesus. When he escaped, he let death become the final answer. He gave up. Hard to believe. Time goes fast. 25 years ago, okay, this weekend, uh, Timothy McVeigh attacked the federal building in Oklahoma City. Time goes fast, 25 years. And every April the 19th, I think about that attack on the federal building, and one picture always haunts me. And it was a picture of a little girl being pulled out of the rubble. And just the previous day, uh, she was celebrating her first birthday. And instead of celebrating her first birthday again, in a few days she was buried. The news media does what the news media does. They ask all different kinds of questions. And they ask that little girl's mother, how do you go on? How do you go on knowing that, that your little girl is dead? And the mother said, digging deep down into her soul, she said, I know that someday I'm going to be able to see her again. The, the truth is that that little girl should be celebrating her 26th birthday, but she can't. The mother has hope because the mother didn't give up. 
She believed that there was more to life than this world has to offer, that death is not the final answer. The final answer is, and always will be, Jesus. We all have questions and doubts. Some years ago, I was at the church and I got a call, a random call, uh, from a Youngstown State student by the name of Derek. Okay? And Derek introduced himself, said he was in the religion class, and in the religion class, they had to go out and find a local minister to, to ask him a series of questions. And I was glad to do it. We met here, you know, probably on a Monday night, and we sat off to the side when, when Derek arrived, you know. He was a typical college student, and, and he was a good kid. And he looked at me, and I've always said this, if people are honest with me, I'll work with anybody. And Derek looked at me, and he goes, before I ask my questions, I have a confession. I said, Derek, what's your confession? And he says, I got a lot of doubts, and I have a lot of questions about the faith. He says, I hope that doesn't bother you. I said, Derek, that doesn't bother me. People with doubts and questions don't bother me. People that think they have all the answers terrify me. Voltaire wasn't wrong. He said, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. Will you all please pray with me? Dear Father, as we come here at this moment, we're thankful for this opportunity of being together. We're thankful that you gave us minds. We're not robots just programmed to do certain things. We're individuals, and we're individuals with minds that you expect us to use. And so may we wrestle with the doubts and the questions that we have because it's the sign of a growing faith. Once again, it's your will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.